Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody, and welcome to everybody. Uh, Andreas, Angela, Mary, I almost said my own name, Sarah, Shabana, and Linda. And uh, this is the Friendship with God or Conversations with God book group. And uh, but Linda, you'll have to tell us what chapter we're on. Okay, I believe that we are in chapter 15, which in the print copy is page, and where we are in chapter 15 is page 312. Okay. All right, <clears throat> if you'd like to go ahead and start. Okay, thank you. Friendship, friendship with God, an uncommon dialogue. This is Neil speaking. You have discussed this before, and so I get that it must be pretty important. You're saying that to be totally loving means to be fully free. Yes, and to allow others to be fully free. You mean everyone should be able to do anything they want? That is what I mean. To the degree that it is humanly possible to allow that, yes. That is what I mean. That is how God loves. God allows. Uh, I allow everyone to do anything they want. Without consequence or punishment? The two are not the same thing. As I have now told you repeatedly, there is no such thing as punishment in my kingdom. On the other hand, there is such a thing as a consequence. A consequence is a natural outcome. A punishment is a normal one. It is normal in your society to punish. It is abnormal in your society to simply allow a consequence to assert itself, to reveal itself. Punishments are your announcement that you are too impatient to await a natural outcome. Are you saying no one should be punished for anything? Well, that's something you have to decide. Indeed, you are deciding it every day. As you continue to make your ongoing choices about this, you may feel it beneficial to consider what method you find most effective in causing your society or anything or anyone within it to change behaviors. This is, after all, your purposes of retribution for basically getting even. Create. High societies have observed that little You keep cutting out on me, Linda. Yeah, for me too. Linda? I don't know if she can hear us or not. Linda? Um, it says, I am the host now. Okay. Well, let's see here. Linda, are you there? I'm back. I'm going to okay. come in on the computer. to use the phone than the computer. Uh, second, just All right, we're going to leave the audio. Sorry about this. 
but it happens every now and then. Now, Linda, if you're speaking, we're not hearing you. Um, Christine, do you want to go ahead and start reading until Linda gets back? God, guys, I'm sorry. I have no idea what's going on. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you now. Yeah, we can hear okay. you now. We got two All right. Linda's on the screen. Yeah, I've got the computer trying to join too as a backup, but it, that's not working real well either. Um, either. So I um, think, Nanette, so I'm I not the host. Not oh, well, it's recording. It says it's recording, so we're good. Yeah, it, it threw it back to me, which is okay. Because okay. the sun's coming out here. Okay. So, what was the last thing you heard me say? I don't know. Did you Did hear you me hear say, me say are, are, are you are saying you no one is to be punished for anything? That yeah. sounds familiar. Okay. So, go back on mute so I don't have an echo and I'll pick up from there. Okay. Okay. Are you saying that no one should be punished for anything? That is something you have to decide. Indeed, you are deciding it every day. As you continue to make ongoing choices about this, <laughs> as you continue to make your ongoing choices about this, you may feel it beneficial to consider what method you find most effective in causing your society or anything within it or anything to within it to ch ch change, change behaviors. behaviors. And now I'm now hearing, I'm hearing an echo. Okay, here we go. Got it. This is, after all, your presumed reason for imposing punishments to punish for purposes of retribution, for basically getting even, will not create the kind of society you say you wish to create. Highly evolved societies have observed that little is learned from punishments. They have concluded that consequences are the better teacher. All sentient beings know the difference between punishments and consequences. Punishments are artificially created outcomes. Consequences are naturally occurring outcomes. Punishments are imposed from the outside by someone with a value system different from the one being punished. Consequences are experienced on the inside by the self. Punishments are someone else's decision that one has done something wrong. Consequences are one's own experience that something does not work. That is, it did not produce the intended result. Okay, so in other words, we do not learn quickly from punishments because we see them as something that someone else is doing to us. We learn more readily from consequences because we see them as something that we are doing to ourselves. Precisely, you have it exactly. But can't a punishment be a consequence? Isn't that the point? Punishments are artificially created outcomes, not naturally occurring results. So the attempt to convert a punishment into a consequence by simply calling it that does not make it that. Only the most immature being can be fooled by such a verbal contrivance, and even that mean not for very long. This has not stopped many of those among you who have parented offspring to use the contrivance. And the biggest punishment that you have devised is withholding your love. You have shown your offspring that, that if they behave in a certain way, you will withhold your love. It is by granting and the withholding of your love that you have sought to regulate and modify to control 
and to create your children's behaviors. This is something God would never do. Yet you have told your children that I do it too. No doubt to justify your own actions. But I tell you this. True love never withdraws itself. And that is what loving fully means. It means your love is full enough to hold the biggest wrong behavior. It means that more than that, it means no behavior is even called wrong. So Eric Segal had it right. Love means never having to say you're sorry. That is exactly correct. Yet, it is a very high principle, not practiced by many human beings. Most human beings cannot even imagine it being practiced by God. And they are right. I do not practice it. Uh, I beg your pardon? I am it. One does not have to practice what one is. One simply is it. I am the love that knows no condition, nor limitation of any kind. I am totally loving. And to be totally loving means to be willing to give every mature sentient being total freedom to do, be, and have that which they wish. Even if you know it will be bad for them, it is not for you to decide for them. Even our children? If they are mature, sentient beings, no. If they are grown children, no. And if they are not yet mature, the fastest way to lead them to their own maturity is to allow them the freedom to make as many choices as possible as early as practical. This is what love does. Love lets go. That which you call need and that which you often confuse with love does the opposite. Need holds on. This is the way you can tell the difference between love and need. Love goes. Need holds on. Love lets go. Need holds on. So to be totally loving, I let go? Among other things, yes. Let go of expectation. Let go of requirements and rules and regulations that you would impose on your loved ones. For they are not loved if they are restricted. Not totally. Nor are you. You do not love yourself totally when you restrict yourself, when you grant yourself less than total freedom in any matter. Yet remember that choices are not restrictions. So do not call the choices you have made restrictions. And lovingly provide for your offspring and all your loved ones all the information that you feel you may have to help them make good choices. Good being defined here as those choices most likely to produce a particular desired result as well as what you know to be their greatest desired result, a happy life. Share what you know about that. Offer what you have come to understand. Yet do not seek to impose your ideas, your rules, your choices on another. And do not withhold your love should another make choices that you would not make. Indeed, if you believe their choices to have been poor ones, that is precisely the time to show your love. That is compassion. And there is no higher expression. What else does it mean to be totally loving? It means to be fully present in every moment. To be fully aware. To be fully open, honest, transparent. It means to be fully willing to express the love that is in your heart full out. To be fully loving means to be fully naked, without hidden agenda or hidden motive, without hidden anything. And you say that it is possible for human beings, for regular people like me, 
to achieve such love? This is something of which we are all capable? It is more than that of which you are capable. It is that of which you are. This is the nature of who you are. The most difficult thing that you do is to deny that. And you are doing this difficult thing every day. It is why your life seems so, feels so difficult. Yet when you do the easy thing, when you decide to come from, to be who you really are, which is pure love, unlimited and unconditioned, then your life becomes easy again. And the turmoil disappears. All the struggles go away. This peace may be achieved in any given moment. The way to it may be found by asking a simple question. What would love do now? The magic question again. Yes, this is a marvelous question because you will always know the answer. It's like magic. It is cleansing like soap. It takes the worry out of being close. It washes away all doubt, all fear. It bathes the mind with the wisdom of the soul. What a good way of putting that. It is true. When you ask this question, you will instantly know what to do. In any circumstance, under any condition, you will know. You will be given the answer. You are the answer. And asking the question brings forth that part of you. What if you fool yourself? You cannot fool yourself? Hang on, I have to cough. Do not second guess this answer when it instantly comes to you. When you second guess is when you fool yourself and you make a fool of yourself. Go into the heart of love and come from that place in all your choices and decisions and you will find peace. That's the end of chapter 15. Thanks. You're on mute. You're on mute. Isn't it? Thank you. I had to go solve a family situation, um, which is now resolved. Um, so I wasn't here for the last three minutes. Um, but who would like to start the conversation? Well, I think the last word, um, you will find peace and um, I'm doing this, uh, the course with um, Bruce Lipton and uh, HeartMath and Greg Braden right now. And it all speaks of our interconnectivity. And, you know, once we realize um, beyond our conditioning and beyond our effects and beyond our self doubts, etc., then um, that's when we see the peace of unity that we're all one. And, um, you know, right now it's almost like I'm tingling. The, pe the peace vibes are just going through my, my body and it feels wonderful. Well, I'll just say that I'm finding, uh, I'm finding it challenging to apply uh, this this very last bit here to some of the uh, political situations that I'm experiencing locally. For example, uh, the wife of the ex city manager last night went on. Facebook and made a post about one of the council women, but she went, the way she did it was she went on to the American Legion Toys for Tot fund drive that they're having, and she made the post there, and she ripped the woman for having received help from the 
American Legion? Like how many, how many dues and contributions did she make? You know, did, did we give her? And, and it started this whole discussion among the community about, you know, first of all, aren't contributions or help from the American Legion, isn't it confidential? You know, all this stuff. And people are just like ripping each other. And I'm reading this chapter and I'm thinking, okay, how do you hold this person who is vilifying and creating and drama and stirring all this up? How do you hold them in love? And how do you keep that loving feeling for them? Uh, and, and at the same time, help. Like, what can you do to help the conversation? And I don't have any answers. I'm just sharing that it's a real challenge for me. And um, I think it's interesting that this is what we got to read this morning. I'm done. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I want to add to what you just said, Linda. Um, because as a grandparent of a nine-year-old, <clears throat> and she lives with me, and so does her mom and her stepdad, um, there are times when it's really difficult to even, though those who we love immensely, like family members, um, that, that I snap, you know, a, and a good example was the other day I was telling her a story that she knew nothing about and, and not like I wasn't reading a book. I was just telling her a memory or something. And she kept finishing my sentences for me. And we were in the car and I, after about the fourth time, I said, stop that. I said, I, you, and I was cranky about it. I said, it's very irritating when you think you know what I'm going to say and you don't. And so, you know, after that was over, I felt bad that I did the, bur the burst out of stop that. Um, and I, even in that situation, I'm not sure how I would have dealt, dealt with that. Sort of like you're not sure how to deal with these people in your local <clears throat> political group. And but maybe what I should have done is said, would you please stop that? We're going to have a moment of silence. Please do not finish my sentences so that you can, you know, not be triggered. And I know it's not a spiritual gathering that you're talking about, Linda, but it does seem like if it were brought to some, you know, the group's attention that maybe we all just need to take a couple deep breaths. Over. Well, I think when it, when whenever we get triggered is an opportunity to be tender with ourselves and compassionate with ourselves. Like you know, living in a third dimensional world is um, there are lots of triggers out there. And um, rather than judging yourself for being triggered, be compassionate towards yourself. It sounds like this person is is just mean, Linda. And uh, yeah, so you know, and so much of the political. Uh, scene is based on meanness and competition instead of cooperation and compassion, right? It's old program. Yeah, I guess my question is how do you model unconditional love to that person? Well, maybe in the moment, um, you know, you just accept that you can't, you don't know how, because you're triggered. Yeah, well, I'm not, in, in my case, I'm not triggered. I wasn't triggered. I'm not triggered, I don't feel. It's, it's more of trying to observe what's happening and figure out how to live what Neil's talking about here, what God's talking about. It's like, 
it's it's more of for me it's more of the the practical application like here's an instance of it how do you practically apply it um and I, and that's where i'm fi i find the challenge it's it's you know it's it it kind of is the same uh challenge as you know we create our reality right there's nothing out here it, it's pretty much everything is coming from what we're creating within us and so when i come around the corner three days in a row and i see a trailer parked in the road you know who 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 created that you know it's like where did that come from and and why is it there and what is the experience we're supposed to be getting from it so it's the same kind of idea with this with this situation that i brought up it's like the challenge for me is in 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 how is it that i live live the words model the words what would be the thing to say in in the facebook thread to show love to her, how would one go about doing that? Um, that's more of what, what I was kind of getting at. Yeah, when you're triggered, that's a whole different thing. And, and, um, and, and there's that to talk about too, like with, with what happened with, with Nanette sharing, you know, four times. I had that same kind of agitation with my granddaughter not long ago. You know, it was like, um, she just kept saying stuff that wasn't true. And at one point I just finally said, you know, you, you've got to stop that. You know, <laughs> you, you can't just let your mouth run um, all the time when you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and again, you know, but I didn't have a punishment for her. You know, that the, the discussion earlier in the chapter of the difference between punishment and consequence um, is also, you know, that's, that's, I won't go there right now, but that's an interesting aspect of this chapter as well. I'll stop for now. Thank you. Yes. My thought on the subject of what to do with that person is, you know, to try to say something that points them back to the fact that they are love also. So I'm not sure what specifically that would be, but possibly maybe not in a public thread, point them to, you know, how would they feel if somebody was saying that kind of thing about them or someone that they cared about? Just my thought. That's a good point, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah, one, go ahead. Let's say, I mean, it says, we've just read on, on the, in the chapter there, the magic question is, what would love do now? And it says, um, you would always know the answer. It's like magic. It's like cleansing soap. So with regard to this, the Facebook thread, maybe if nothing comes to you, Linda, to say, maybe it's best to actually say nothing. Sometimes, you know, it's best to keep quiet. And maybe when it is time to say something, then the words will come, perhaps. And with yourself, Nana, I mean, with your child, I mean, and also, uh, Linda, with your granddaughter, it's your duty, it's your duty to put her right on that. And I don't think that, uh, Nana, you said anything wrong. Maybe a way of saying, maybe you're getting a bit agitated, but it's nothing wrong with telling her that, you know, it's not maybe best not to answer people's or to finish people's sentences for, for them. You know, you're putting a right on that, I think. You're on mute. Uh, that raises another good point, Angela, because we do have a job as parents and grandparents. And I think that when we do those things, I'm getting a really funky echo. Don't know what's going on. Please, okay now, uh, Okay. Um, so anyway, I think, you know, we do have to remind ourselves, and as Christine would say, be gentle with ourselves. Um, because there is no, as we all know who are, 
there's no magic book um, that tells us, you know, like when somebody keeps doing something, doing something, doing something, or when Linda was talking about her granddaughter that was doing, talking about things they didn't know about, you know, you can either let them flounder so they go out and irritate other people, or you, you don't necessarily have to have the attitude that I had because I was like, hey, you're driving me crazy. I didn't say that, but I just said, stop it. And, um, and, and I would think with Angela, what you said about the Facebook page, <clears throat> because I'm one of the people that runs the Facebook page for humanities team. And there's almost 700,000 people on that page. And if somebody comes in and says something really out of line, I just, and I'm, and what I mean by out of line is like pornographic, sexual, weird stuff. I just go over and delete them. <laughs> um, but when somebody says something that's, you know, kind of snotty to, to somebody who's made a comment, I wait for about 15 minutes to see if somebody else will jump in instead of having it just be me. And Linda, I don't know. Um, did you say you did comment, Linda? Uh, I don't think I commented to her, no. Well, <clears throat> I really like peaceful, nice comments. And if somebody brings up a, g a good point about somebody else's situation, then that's okay. But I think if you're going to, I think Angela mentioned this too, if you're going to comment to the person on the Facebook page, if you choose to, I would do that privately. And then I would do, oh, did you guys hear that big thunder? Yeah. Um, I, anyway, I'm going to be quiet and let somebody else talk. Does anybody want to talk about consequences versus punitive or uh, not punitive punishment? Um, I'll jump in and say that when I was uh, married to my first husband, um, we were introduced to what is called parent effectiveness training, PET. And um, I believe that if everyone were to be trained in that philosophy of, of uh, parenting, we'd have a completely different kind of society and world because it's really based on this fundamental concept um, of communication with your children and uh, setting things up ahead of time so that they know what the consequence of their behavior is rather than being dished out a punishment. And, and basically what you do is as soon as they're old enough that they have language, you, you uh, talk about like, let's say you're gonna go to the store and let's say you've got a kid that is constantly, you know, like grabbing candy and saying, give me this, give me this or something. So you sit them down and you say, okay, we're all gonna go to the store my expectation of you is this, and you explain what your expectation of their behavior is, and then you set it up ahead of time. If you do as we ask you to do, then the consequence is going to be we're going to get to go out for ice cream. If, or whatever, you know, I'm just throwing that out as an example. If, however, you don't behave the way we want you to in the store, then we're not going to get to go for ice cream. So ahead of time, the child knows. So when they get to the store, they have it in their head. Okay, I can have ice cream if I behave. And if I don't behave, I'm not going to get ice cream. Then if they don't behave, it's, there's no scene. There's, no, there's nothing. You just say, well, okay, I guess we're not going for ice cream. 
and they've they they know and ultimately it makes it their choice because they knew ahead of time so much parenting is based on punishment you may tell them the expectation but you don't tell them ahead of time what the consequence is if they don't follow through and then when they don't follow through you punish them and it's arbitrary and capricious from the kids point of view because they didn't know what was coming and now you're just on a power trip because you're bigger than they are and you can tell them or shove them or whatever and that's that's how so much you know um discord in the family comes from all of that kind of behavior so i love the conversation about the difference between consequences and punishment i'm complete Well, <clears throat> I'm going to definitely remember a few things you just said there because if you don't, if you don't lay out the, the terms in the beginning, <laughs> as it were, you know, like saying if you if you behave well over at the grocery store, then we, you know, I the only thing I would change differently. I said we might go to the ice cream because invariably they'll say we'll definitely go and then something happens and we can't go um but i like that way of saying here's the deal you know and um and then it, it's like you said it's their choice over I'll share an experience I had with my grandson or my uh, stepson. He was about, I want to say he was about seven. And he was going through a really sassy f f stage um, where, you know, you'd say something and then he'd just be sassy with you about it. And uh, so we were trying to extinguish that behavior. And the agreement was, okay. If you are sassy, then you're going to go have a timeout. And a uh, timeout in our house was you, he went into the bathroom and he sat with the door open, the lid down. He just sat on the toilet in the dark with the door open. And it was a straight shot. I could see right into the bathroom from, from the kitchen where I usually was working. And so first day he comes home from school, gets sassy. I remind him of the agreement. He goes into the bathroom. The next day he comes home, he's sassy. I remind him of the agreement. He goes into the bathroom. The third day he comes home, he's sassy. I remind him of the, oh, I didn't even have to, remind. he's sassy. He stops, he catches himself. He looks at me and he goes, I'll go. And he put himself in the bathroom and he was never sassy again after that. That's funny. I mean, he probably didn't think it was that funny, but. No, but he, he extinguished the behavior himself. Yeah. In three days. So, and those books are still, you can uh, Google it in uh, Amazon and parent effectiveness training is still available in paperback, I believe. I'm also. Hi. Hi, Ann. Hi, Ann. Hi. Hi, hi. So, but I'm also thinking about, think about animals and how we train animals. Um, if you set it up right, they'll do just about anything for a treat. You know, it's kind of like that's the way we're raised, too. It's like you're rewarded for the things you do right or for the rules you follow. You get a good, out a boy, out a girl, whatever. And if not, then it goes the other way. So we really learn by a system of rewards and punishments. I mean, that's just the way where society sets it up. I, I agree. And I think you could even take the word punishment out because for pets, it's condition response. When I say sit and you sit and I give you a little goodie, or if you don't sit, I, you don't get the goodie. Um, and I think 
um, I don't disagree with you with that that's the way most of us were raised, not with condition response, but with you know the punishment thing and I know I, that i have I have a feral cat mm -hmm. and she does not she's not close to anyone but me, and I've been able to because she loves treats, I found her favorite treats I've been able to teach her to sit to down to roll over to sit up and beg to play dead to do hi fi a she cat? Walks upon us. <laughs> she had my cats <laughs> wow yeah, that's so. Take some patience, because my cats just look at me and and they like, are you crazy? I'm not doing that. <laughs> well, not. you didn't find the street anyway. Okay. Yep. <laughs> wow. But you're right. It's condition like condition response. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, no, I just wanted to clarify, you do make me chuckle actually when you say that you might not be able to get for ice cream, but I think the idea is for it to work, is for it to be achievable, so it would be something, if you were going to do it with your granddaughter, it would be something that she would be able to do, the positive, you know, the positive thing, it would be something that um, would be achievable, if you see what I mean, like watch a movie or watch a favourite thing or something that you could provide for her. Mm -hmm. And I think too that sometimes what we're doing with our children, our nieces, nephews, whatever, is that we're trying to teach them uh, an example. Is my granddaughter has this thing where she, when she comes in the house, she lets the door just slam and it always makes me jump. It just always makes me jump. And so for about maybe three or four days, like Linda was saying with her grandson, every time Piper slammed the door, and it wasn't like she was trying to slam the door. It's just she was allowing it to slam. I said, okay, I need, I need you back here by the door again. I said, now I want you to open and shut that door 10 times and not let it slam. And she's not letting it slam anymore. Over. Is Shabana on the call or is she just? Well, I see her head, but I mean, I, I don't, she hasn't replied. Okay. I think that it's, it's, uh, I think projection is something that people should be taught about in the elementary school, and they're not. Um, so much of what we think is happening to us or, you know, in, in other people is really, it's our creation. And, and that's why the four agreements from uh, Don Miguel Ruiz are so great, because the, the one, don't make assumptions, is the one that sort of counters the, the whole projection thing. Because when you're projecting, you're, you're thinking that other people are doing or feeling or saying things, and, and it's all through your filter. And when you stop yourself and remember not to make assumptions, it's one of the best things you can do to break through that projection fog. I'm complete and I see Shabani here. Just before I start, I want to uh, tell everyone that I'm completely, I'm just flabbergasted by hearing what you've got to say because um, when I proceeded to repeat the negative behavior of two different people. Everyone told me to just stop now. <laughs> like the people I see will not tolerate it. 
because the world has changed. It's just not possible to behave that way anymore. It was embarrassing, but very encouraging because my sense is that Nanette and Linda are dealing with very large numbers of people and they only have these jobs because they're fully capable of healing the whole planet, even though they've got ups and downs. I'm, I'm saying that I'm proud of you. Thank you, Shabana. Thank you, Shabana. You're very sweet. Well, I'm proud of you. And uh, if it's okay with the, for the meditation, may I just um, give thanks from my personal experience that if this happened to me, then whatever's going to happen to the people Nanette and uh, Linda are working with is going to be magnified. I mean, the, no one will tolerate it at all, that they'll do the job for you. Is that okay? May I start? Well, let's wait two minutes. Um, okay. Does anybody else have anything they want to share? And we can do the meditation and finish a couple minutes early, but does anybody else want to share? Well, I, I also do, um, James Twyman, Soul of Attraction, and we have a call um, for about half an hour, 20 minutes, half an hour, Monday to Friday, every day. And the Friday call this week, and it's all based on A Course in Miracles, um, was it was kind of very revealing to me in that, you know, God doesn't have a memory. God lives in the eternal now moment. And it's like, in, in terms of my humanity, you know, I, I'm often try and make the past and the future the same and of course it can't be done but um i just found it very comforting and and to practice this like hourly daily you know that god doesn't have a memory so whatever you do um and it's like Neil's work says it too. It's like, you know, whatever you do, um, you're not being judged for it. And if you judge, then you're judging yourself, right? God's not judging you. Okay. Um, Shabana, if you want to go ahead and start, unless somebody else has one more thing they want to add. Do you want to wait a bit? No, you can go ahead and go. Okay. Almighty God, there's only one reason we came to the planet, which is to demonstrate our personal magnificence. And I thank you on behalf of everyone in this group, that once we join our heart in your heart and come from that place, as Christine said, no answer means that the silence which these people will receive will be deafening, amen.
Thank you, Shabana. Yes, thank you, Shabana. You're welcome. And I have a quick question. Whoever's got a hard copy of the book, um, could you tell me how many more chapters there are of the one we're reading right now? Okay, well, according to Kindle, we're over 70%. Uh, I'm glad you brought this up because I was going to bring it up and I forgot. Um, we're over 70% through, so we should be looking at whatever the next one is. And I'm looking right now to answer your question. Well, um, you just a little mind reader, you little Linda. <laughs> Linda <Pedia>. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, there's no table of contents, but let me see here. Um, yeah, there's about, we're about, a. looks like there's about 100 pages left. And um, let me see if I can get to the last 18. 20 and a closing. Okay. Well, next week I will come prepare. I don't know. Do you want to still keep reading the books in, um, in the order they were published? Well, that makes sense. I mean, how far are we into this? Kind of change it now. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, well, I will come to the table with the book that comes after Friendship with God, and I think it's either Tomorrow's God or Communion with God. Um, but I, I need to look that up to be sure. Um, Nanette, I've got a request, please. Certainly. I'm taking, thank you, if, if you'll just allow me. Um, Neil's, I'm taking Neil's Evolving Wisdom class where you're supposed to live from the agenda of the soul. And mm -hmm. um, he was uh, recommending Happier Than God. Is there any chance that you could do that? Um, well, I think probably three or four or five of us, we've already read that book yeah, in the group. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't mean we can't do it again once we, you know, get to where yeah. we're going. But um, happier than God. Wasn't that the guy from England? Angela, you know him. Michael something. Gregory? Yeah, Michael, Michael Gregory. Gregory. Yeah. 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 Yep. Um. You know, and there's nothing to say that once we get through the, the Neil books that we can't find a different, you know, we don't forget about Neil, but we could, you know, read something by Eckhart Tolle or Deepak, Bert, Deepak Marianne Williamson. Um, and we can all bring our ideas to the table and we can vote on them. I would like to get through the conversations with God books because my very favorite one in the world is home with God. But you know what? Neil said at this thing I was just at that he's got two more conversations with God books coming out. Now, I don't know if he just misspoke or if there are actually conversations with God, um, but we'll find out. So, anyway, everybody, I love you, and uh, love you too. We will see each other love next. Week. All right, love you. Bye, bye, bye everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.